Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Shaw. I'm a psychology professor here at Lafayette College, and I'm honored to be part of this exciting event today. Now, as you know, the theme of today's conference is solving for why. The why that I'm going to talk about is the why that represents the essence of each one of us as individuals. That is, who we are. Every day, we constantly try to solve for why. You try to figure out, who are you? Who am I? Who's that person over there? When you meet someone for the first time, you try to solve for why. When someone applies for a job, both the interviewer and the job applicant are trying to solve for why. When college admissions committees review those thousands of files they get every year, they're trying to solve for why. They're trying to find the essence of the people that are buried beneath those grades and SATs and extracurricular activities. When two people are sizing each other up as potential long-term mates, they're definitely trying to solve for why. And that process can take months or sometimes even years. Now, as you've probably figured out, solving for why is really hard work and can take a lot of time. Ah, we have a shortcut. Instead of doing all that work, we can use labels. And that's what my talk is about today. Now, I've got a word cloud that's floating above me on the screen here. And these are labels of different groups of people. Uh, in creating this word cloud, I made a list, and I was able to come up with over 100 labels in just a few minutes' time. I've just included about 20 or 30 for readability up here. And I'd like everybody to take a moment and look at the word cloud and see what labels mean something to you. So just take a couple of seconds and take a look. And as you, as you scan through it, you'll see some labels you're familiar with, maybe some you're not familiar with. What you will notice is that many of these labels can evoke strong emotions. Some of these labels might make you proud. Some of them might make you happy. Some of the labels might make you sad. Some might even make you angry. Another thing about labels is they affect people in different ways. My reaction to the label old might be different than your reaction. My reaction to the labels gay, American, tall, black, Democrat, liberal, blonde, disabled may be different than your reactions. But we all have strong reactions to these labels. As we're going to see today, the labels can affect both the people being labeled as well as the labelers themselves. And one thing to keep in mind is the effects of these labels occur even if we don't say them or use them. All we have to do is think about them. Now the use of labels starts really early. It starts at the very beginning. When a child is about to be born or even before, everybody wants to know, is it a boy or is it a girl? And so they ask that question, aunts, uncles, friends, relatives, even strangers will ask, is it a boy or is it a girl? Now the answer to that seemingly simple question can have a lifetime of consequences. It could affect uh, whether that child plays with trucks or dolls. It could affect what color crayons that child uses. It could affect when that child gets to high school whether the child plays football or field hockey. It might even affect whether the child wants to be a nurse or a doctor. All as a result of this simple kind of uh, question. If you don't believe me, take a look at these pictures of girls and boys toys here. And if you can get past the pinkness and the blueness of the pictures, you will see that on the left in the girls' toys, most of the toys are domestic toys, cooking, there's a lot of apparel, there's dolls. On the right, there are boys' toys that are action toys, they're building toys, they're sports kinds of toys. Um, simply because the toys have gender labels, just like the children do. So there's girls' toys and there's boys' toys. So I would suggest that the next time somebody asks the question, is it a boy or is it a girl, the best answer to give is that it's simply a baby. And as an aside here, this is, I have two children, a boy and a girl, and this is a uh, picture of one of them, and I'm not really sure which one, because it's just a baby, okay? All right, so people are really, really, really good at using labels. Unfortunately, so are institutions. I've listed some of the institutions up here. Schools, hospitals, employers, businesses, the government, media, politicians. They're all really, really good at using labels. Think of the labels they put on us. They label us by our gender, by our age, by our country of origin, by our race, by our ethnicity, by our religion, by all sorts of things. And so they, they treat us this way and categorize us and put us into groups. The first time you go to a doctor's office, you fill out an information form. Think of, what you, think of the labels you put on that form. They ask you your age, they ask you your gender, they ask you your race, they will often ask you whether you're married, they will ask you whether you're a smoker, whether you're a drinker, these are all labels. And those labels can affect how the doctor sees you and it might even affect how she treats you. 
Now here's a map most of us are familiar with. This is a map that I, I took from just before the election in the fall. And this is the traditional map that the media uses to characterize voting patterns in the states. So the red states are Republican, the deep blue states are Democrat, then we have light blue states that are um, leaning Democrat, we have purple states that are kind of a mixture, we have some peach states, I assume those are supposed to be like red, but they appear peach, and those are supposed to be leaning Republican. Now we're in Pennsylvania here, there are about 13 million of us who live in Pennsylvania, and think how absurd it is to label all Pennsylvanians as light blue. We're a very diverse group in Pennsylvania. We can't all be covered by one label, but these labels affected the way the media uh, covered the election. It certainly affected the way that the candidates uh, ran their campaigns, and it also affected voted be voter behavior. If you're a Democrat in a state that's bright red up on the screen behind me, you might be less likely to vote because you think your vote might not matter. So labels are incredibly powerful. So labels are powerful, they're, they come automatically, and they're resistant to change. And again, we don't actually have to even use the labels. All we have to do is think about the labels. Now, labels can affect both the people being labeled and the labelers. Let's talk about the people being labeled first. I've got some fairly technical terms up here. Self-fulfilling prophecy, stereotype threat, decrease in self-esteem, etc. And so labels can affect the people being labeled. I'm going to talk about one of these and just walk you through it. Stereotype threat. So stereotype threat is the way that stereotypes can affect people's performance in real world situations. I've chosen a common stereotype, and that's girls are bad at math. Of course it's not true, but most people have heard that stereotype. Girls are bad at math. So here's what happens. I've got a couple of girls here. They look like they're in junior high. They're taking a standardized test. And so at the top of the form, they put their name. And maybe even sometimes they uh, put their gender at the top, but they don't have to. As soon as they put their name or their gender, that activates the label that they are female. And along with that label comes the stereotype that girls are bad at math. And then the girls can start to get nervous and anxious, and it can actually affect their performance on the test. There have been dozens and dozens of studies that have shown this. They've shown this with gender, they've shown it with race, they've shown it with other characteristics as well. And so the girls perform poorly on the test, confirming the stereotype that's not true in the first place. Okay? So that's the real danger of something like stereotype threat. But one thing we don't often think about is the effect of labels on the people who are doing the labeling. So when we use labels, we become lazy perceivers. We oversimplify the world and we succumb to prejudice and discrimination. What I mean by that is we start looking at people as members of categories rather than as individuals. Okay? And so let me give you a couple of examples. So here's Luke Skywalker. He almost always is depicted in white and his arch nemesis, uh, Darth Vader, who's almost always depicted in black. So we have the labels white and black. It's fairly easy in people's minds to have those morph into good and evil. So white becomes good and black becomes evil. Here we have Glinda the Good Witch of the South from The Wizard of Oz. She's always depicted as being beautiful. We have the Wicked Witch of the West, who's usually depicted as being ugly. So we have two labels here, beautiful and ugly, and they also can morph into good or evil. So we have words like white and black that become good and evil. We have words like beautiful and ugly that become good and evil. So one of the real dangers of labels is the fact that they can morph into even additional labels. Now a set of labels that's particularly damaging are mental health labels. And these are labels that society places on people with certain psychological disorders and conditions. Let's take a look and look at this, at this um, word cloud. And I want to let you know, I couldn't possibly include all the labels here. I just included a few so that they would be readable. Some of these labels might jump out at you, not because of the size of the font or the size of the word, but because maybe of a personal experience or someone you know. But these are labels that in almost all cases have negative, effect, negative effects on the people being labeled. Okay? But they can also have effects on the labelers, and this is really important because when people use these labels or even think about them, we might treat people with these psychological disorders differently than we would if we didn't have the label. And another thing that's interesting is these are not actually labels of people. The first word cloud were labels of groups of people. This is not. These are labels of disorders and conditions. But what happens is when we use these labels, the research shows that the people become the labels, both in their own eyes and in the eyes of the people who are doing the labeling. So you can see there's really, really damaging long-term effects for both groups of people for these kinds of labels. So what can we do? Okay, we've we, we pretty much all agree that having labels can affect both the people being labeled and the people that are doing the labeling. Well, we can try looking beyond the labels. Okay? So instead of seeing merpeople and humans, we could see King Triton 
and Ariel. Instead of seeing beasts and humans, we could see Prince Adam and Bell. I bet most of you didn't know that his name was uh, Prince Adam. Um, and, and I had to actually look it up before uh, uh, preparing the talk. And instead of ogres, we could see Shrek and Fiona. So we can try looking beyond the labels, but you know what? It's really hard. Once the labels are out there, and when you look at these pictures, I see ogres and beasts and merpeople. So it's really hard to not use the labels once they're out there because they're powerful, they're automatic, and they're resistant to change. So even better, we might try not using the labels at all. So my example here is I've chosen weeds. And weed is a, I chose it because I think it's a universally negative label. We don't like weeds, they're unsightly. Um, we try to get rid of them. In the United States, we spend tens of millions of dollars every single year trying to banish weeds from our gardens, from our lawns. They're just a big nuisance, okay? However, if you look at weeds individually, you will see that they're not so bad at all. Weeds are just a, are plants. And this one, for instance, is white Dutch clover. It's a rather beautiful plant. The next one, these are all classified as weeds. This is violet, clearly a beautiful plant. And if we look at these individuals, we can see the individualism and the beauty in each one of them. This one is Creeping Charlie. And my favorite, the last one, is the dandelion. And if we get beyond the labels and look at these as individual plants, we will see that they're unique and they're beautiful. Now, I think this approach to weeds was summed up really nicely by A.A. A. Milne, the author of Winnie the Pooh. And he said, Weeds are flowers too, once you get to know them. So maybe that's the approach we should take when we solve for why. Instead of using labels as we're trying to figure out who people are, maybe we should simply try to get to know them. Because after all, Y doesn't equal X, we know that. Y does not equal W, and it certainly doesn't equal Z. No, instead, Y equals a really complex, beautiful set of factors that make each one of us who we are as individuals. So as we go about the world and try to solve for why, let's all see if we can avoid using labels as we're solving for why. Thank you very much. Thank you.